do the public think now? Find out next on the London... Wednesday at 9. Do we know the victim? An all-new Taggart. Cars registered to Detective Inspector McDonald. Blair McDonald was one of our own. I want the scum who killed him nailed to a cross. But are some ghosts better left undisturbed? I'm trying to run a murder inquiry here. How can I do that without all the facts? Blair was the most highly respected officer in this station. In other words, an official cover-up. Truth and justice are about to collide. Taggart, Wednesday at 9 on ITV. Now on LWT, the London programme. It's been an absolute disaster. Without a doubt, Tony Blair would rather have Norris as mayor than Livingstone, whom he loathes with a passion. And without doubt, William Hague would much rather have Ken Livingstone as mayor because he hopes he will prove to be an illustration of what old, mad, swivel-eyed left-wing Labour used to be. In July this year, the whole of London's future will be in the hands of a new American-style mayor. Tonight, the London programme asks, will the capital get a candidate it really wants, or just another political stooge? Offered a mayor by Tony Blair back in 1998, Londoners voted yes. There were muted celebrations. Only a third of the capital's five million voters had bothered to turn out for the mayoral referendum. A majority of a minority showed enthusiasm despite New Labour's experiment with polling booths in Tesco stores. It was all very low key. Then, the government commitment to devolving power to the capital became a hot political story. Red Ken, the rebel of the old GLC, whose left-wing politics had outraged Margaret Thatcher, said he would stand. New Labour's proposal for a new mayor turned into a political nightmare. Blair, like so many people who've worked closely with Ken Livingstone, absolutely loathes him, detests him, and believes genuinely that he would be a complete disaster for London. And he can't quite conceive why the public don't share this view. He knows they don't because he reads the opinion polls, and he must be able to talk to people who will tell him the same thing. And that's partly why he appears to be so covered and obsessed with hatred of Livingstone. He's barely able to control himself when he's talking about Livingstone. This is a serious election. It matters. If you wonder why I have said the things that I have and raised the questions I have about Ken Livingston as the Labour candidate, it is because we cannot afford a return to gesture politics. We cannot afford a situation in which someone is calling for the sacking of the Chancellor. If you ever watch him when he's speaking about Livingston at a public rally or on TV, he seems to lose control. And Blair is a very, very controlled speaker, uh, except when he's talking about Livingstone. His eyes bulge, his mouth works too fast. Uh, he loses all that calm. He has to force himself to smile, so it comes over as a sort of horrible, ghastly grin. It, it's quite scary watching Blair talking about Livingstone. It really, really bothers him. True to form, Red Ken himself has upset the government by publicly criticising their policies on transport and he has had to account for himself to the Labour Party committee selecting candidates for the Mayor of London. At the same time, as his own party has tried to stop him standing for Mayor, he has emerged as the most popular candidate so far with the public. Ken Livingstone was the last leader of London. He was made popular by Mrs Thatcher abolishing the JLC. He became the embodiment of, I believe, a real desire on the part of Londoners to have some sort of government. So when Ken Livingston sort of came back to fight again, like, like um, Rip Van Winkle, I think it was inevitable that people would feel affection for him. He's a very good public performer. He's a very good speaker. He's funny. He's very London. He has a kind of quirky London quality. 
he's always had a kind of heroic victim status ever since Mrs. Thatcher abolished the GLC. Um, so I think Labour have been surprised at the leadership level how popular Livingston is. Uh, but they should have seen that earlier. They're supposed to be experienced politicians. The government is backing former health minister Frank Dobson as Livingston's main rival. Oh, I don't have any doubt that Ken is the main rival. Uh, I mean, he's been campaigning for the last 18 months, during which time I was trying to uh, implement Labour's uh, health policies and Glenda was trying to implement our transport policies. Uh, so he's, he was well ahead when we started, but I think I've been catching up. But our telephone canvassing and other indications suggest that Glenda really stands no chance of winning. There is now a three-way contest for the Labour nomination for mayor, canvassing not for the votes of London electors, but of trade unions, party members and MPs are Ken Livingstone's rivals Frank Dobson and Glenda Jackson. The results will be out at the end of this month. If Livingstone wins, New Labour's nightmare will become a political reality. Meanwhile, the Tories have had troubles of their own. Their chosen candidate, Geoffrey Archer, appeared to be a strong runner. Oh, we were on our knees begging for Archer to win. We'd have sacrificed um, a few cows like the ancient Greeks in order to get Archer as the candidate. I wanted to see his campaign strategy, which was, I believe, to uh, uh, give £2,000 to every complete stranger he met at Victoria Station. 130 anywhere in the room, 125 for the first time, for the second time, for the second prize. I think Geoffrey Archer is going to be missed. I mean, he was an extremely colourful character. He was a very effective campaigner. I also have to say he was the first. I mean, he established this race as a genuine race. Uh, he went to America. He mimicked American political campaigning. Um, he did have some good ideas for London. I don't think he was appropriate for the mayoralty, and I'm, to that extent, glad he's gone. Scandal brought Archer down and brought back in the man he had beaten for the Tory nomination, Stephen Norris. Then, Norris was rejected by their selection committee for his admitted philandering. Then he was reinstated as a contender and is now running on the Tory ticket. Nothing more lurid than her politically correct yellow Doc Martins have so far attended the campaigning of Susan Kramer, the Liberal Democrat candidate. Well, I'll have to confess that the scandals have helped me. I mean, in one sense, they've kept me off the pages. You know, I haven't had a scandal to match. And people have said, you know, can you go find yourself a skeleton? But the, but the reality is that a lot of people would automatically have just ticked Labour or ticked Tory are interested in thinking again. So I'm very happy with how this election is going for me personally. Just a bit sad for London that it's been such a farce. I'll do that. Thank you. Until Labour chooses its candidate, a big question mark hangs over the whole campaign for mayor. And there are some dark horses in the contest. One-time manager of the Sex Pistols, Malcolm McLaren, is a rank outsider with attitude. If you look at all these candidates, you think, well, what's they brought to the table? Could you please tell me, we've got a failed Minister of Health being given us as some kind of stooge candidate of the Labour Party in the form of a guy that the Mirror nicknamed today Dobbo. Or we've got someone else that the press nicknamed Shagger Norris. A blokey sort of guy, but a guy who failed as a Minister of Transport in the government we blew out before. Now he's come back telling us he's going to run the transport system. He's one of the reasons for the transport system being the dreadful mess it's in. Don't these people realise we know this? It has been surrounded by what people regard as chaos. Um, uh, we want odd candidates to come forward. We want eccentric ideas to be aired. We want the whole political process to be blown apart and people to talk about it and to you know, go around the pubs chatting about who's in the lead. That's what democratic politics is about. And when this reform was proposed, it was deliberately proposed as being direct election. This was not about the parties and the party's favourite candidates and how the parties would like to run an election. It was about the characters that the, the, the great swamp, if you like, of, of London politics threw into the surf in, up to the surface. Uh, who they'd want to choose, who got the most media attention, who shouted the loudest. It was about stimulating that sort of debate and then choosing the person, not the party, the person you want to represent London. 
Refer to the old grey man from the green <laughs> The candidates themselves agree that the farcical nature of attempts by Labour and the Tories to find suitable candidates for the brand new office of mayor have at least shaken Londoners out of their apathy about the whole idea. If there has been something positive and good that has come out of the confusion over the selection process, not only by the Labour Party, but certainly by the Conservative Party. It is that the issue of the mayor across the whole of London has become one of real interest. Um, it is a topic of conversation that you meet wherever you go. I think the, all the scandals have tended to really drum home the fact there is an election coming. And it's got everyone talking about it and making jokes about it and so on. So certainly there's been a huge amount of coverage, but it has meant, of course, that there hasn't been much in the way of serious discussion about the issues, about the transport or whatever. It's all about the various sort of private live horrors, you know. I don't honestly think, you know, that any of these um, so-called rows and fights have actually damaged the office uh, of mayor. I think actually what they've done is they've made people aware that there's an election going on. And certainly, you know, uh, one of the real risks, it seems to me, to the whole process would have been if we'd got a kind of, you know, usual local authority turnout, high 20s, mid 30s at best uh, percentage. Whereas, in fact, I think we're going to get, you know, pretty healthy percentage because whether you love them or hate them, people are going to know who the candidates are, and I think that's a good thing. An opinion poll commissioned by the London programme confirms that Londoners have not lost any enthusiasm for a new style mayor. Despite the scandals and political infighting, 69% still want a mayor. Londoners have some idea that the new mayor who will eventually move into a brand new headquarters here on the south bank of the Thames will be a novel and untried figure in the capital's politics. But whoever he or she is, they will be a world away from the familiar and virtually powerless ceremonial mayors of the capital's past. I don't think London knows what's going to hit it. The mayor of New York is an epic figure in not just that city's politics, but in the wider politics of America, I mean, you know, the mayor of New York is extremely powerful. The mayor of London won't be quite as powerful, but they'll have the same size electorate, and I think that they will wield within British politics extraordinary influence. But just how powerful could the new mayor be? Weekend FT, and you thought it only covered business. Cutting edge design that you can see, advanced technology that you can't. Forward demands a closer look. The candidates for the new London mayor are lining up. Morning. How are you? All right. But the contest is still wide open. We don't even know who all the candidates will be. The election for the London Mayor is on the 4th of May. For the first time, Londoners will directly elect their mayor. How much power could a new mayor have? I think the genie that Blair's left out of the bottle, the toothpaste that's out of the tube and he can't force back now, is that the mayor will not be just some sort of local worthy whose name nobody knows, as the non-elected mayor is in just about every other big city in, in England 
Uh, he's going to be a figure of real influence, uh, a figure who has instant command of the airwaves and of newsprint, someone who's constantly in the public eye, uh, whose words, whose opinions, whose demands, whose strategies really make a great deal of fuss. And I think the Prime Minister is going to find that that's quite an embarrassment to One view is that anybody with five million votes behind them is going to be able to challenge the Prime Minister next time round. Uh, this is an immensely powerful office, democratically, it has a huge load of franchise behind it. No minister will be able to stand up to a mayor. He'll get to see the prime minister whenever he wants. That's one view. The other view is this is actually a, a wing-clipped office. It's got very little power. It'll have a lot of voters behind it, but that doesn't mean anything. And central government can tell it to get lost whenever it wants. So it, it is just impossible to read how this office is going to play in practice. The Mayor of London's powers are enshrined in one of the weightiest documents ever produced by Whitehall. He or she will lead the London Assembly with 25 elected members and served by a permanent staff of around 400. The Mayor will be able to appoint advisers. The new Town Hall will cost around £26 million a year to run and will have a fixed budget of £3 billion a year to spend. It will be much simpler to understand than the GLC, whose monumental county hall long ago lost its political function to become a place of pleasure when Mrs Thatcher took away its powers. But the much more streamlined new mayor and new assembly are likely to have real teeth and much greater powers than county hall. I think that the new GLA will have significantly more power than the GLC. The crucial difference between that and a mayor and an assembly in this new system is that people will immediately see the one individual who is the mayor, and although their powers are not that great, the legitimacy that election by such a huge city as London will give to this mayor is going to make him or her one of the most powerful politicians in the United Kingdom. The mayors of New York have become legendary figures, and the reason for much of their political power and prominence is that as directly elected leaders, they attract enormous media attention. One of the most successful, running for three four-year terms in a row, was Ed Koch. Okay. The mayor of the city of New York has an enormous opportunity to get uh, his views across, because at City Hall, there are 25 reporters, uh, print, radio, television, assigned every day um, to get stories for their different uh, agencies. And therefore, whatever the mayor says is going to be covered. And therefore, the mayor can mold an impact on public opinion because his views are carried every day on the 6 o'clock news on television. The new London mayor is likely to become the focus of media attention, and though his or her powers will be less than New York mayors, they will certainly be better known than the current minister for London. We looked at the New York experience, but I think we ought to be entirely clear that the mayor of London is not a New York mayor style figure. I'll give you one example. For example, the mayor of London will not be able to invent local taxes in the way that the New York mayor is able to. Uh, and the fact of the matter is as well that the New York mayor has an extremely weak assembly to scrutinize him or her. And the fact is that our London mayor has a stronger assembly to scrutinize his or her activities. To that extent, we actually believe that our London mayor is a more democratic figure than the New York mayor. Whereas New York mayors have often been proudly independent of political affiliation, the first London mayor is likely to be the candidate chosen first by one of the major parties. In other countries, such party control is considered to be against the spirit of mayoral power and influence. I can't conceive, I used to live in America, the idea that someone who was candidate for mayor of New York would campaign on the basis that he was the president's choice or the man Congress wanted to be mayor of New York is unimaginable. It would mean that he was run out of town, certainly not elected. And I think that anyone in London who campaigns on the basis of being approved by Tony Blair will face exactly the same problem. We in London, we're quite conceited actually, we think, and we're right, we live in an amazing, diverse, fantastically exciting, big city, and we don't see why we should be represented by some political stooge. 
the Labour Party electorate in London that electing Frank Dobson would be good for the party is fine and dandy if you're a Labour Party member. <laughs> Uh, the truth is that the individual who is the Labour Party's candidate, if they are to win, will have to appeal to a much wider group than Labour Party voters. This first ever direct election of a London mayor has been turned into a major political battle, not between parties, but within the Labour Party, because Ken Livingstone chose to stand. I think she thought I might be Tom Cruise. If he becomes mayor, the Labour leadership fears he could be a powerful <laughs> opponent of Tony Blair. He is clearly appalled by the prospect of Ken Livingstone. He doesn't want to go back to the old days of the GLC. Uh, but then he drafted an act. I mean, the, the, the Greater London Authority Act is specifically drafted to stop you having another old GLC. So he's got all those defences in place. Now, he may have to stomach Ken Livingstone. Uh, it may well be that he does regret the appearance of chaos that surrounded the selection of the candidates. It may well be that he's, he's worried about it being extended to every other city in Britain, which I believe will soon happen. Um, but that's tough on him. I suspect that Tony Blair saw a mayor for London or for anywhere else as rather in the kind of image he's created for himself. And I don't think he or the rest of the Labour Party fully thought through, until quite recently, the consequences of creating such a powerful office and indeed giving their own local party the freedom to select its own candidate. When the internal party struggle is over next week, all Labour candidates say that in the spirit of party loyalty, they will cast their vote for their former rivals. I mean, I've made quite clear all the way through. I think Frank Dobson would be a good mayor, Glenda Jackson would be a good mayor. I mean, we'd be very different, different styles, different priorities. And it's right that Londoners have a bit of diversity to choose from. I've spent all my time in politics going around campaigning on behalf of whoever was the official Labour candidate anywhere, and no doubt I would do that uh, were uh, it to arise that Ken was the candidate. But I expect to be the candidate myself. I think one of the great things about the Labour Party is, however ferocious the argument may be, um, once the decision is taken, uh, once that democratic decision is arrived at, then the entire party works for whomsoever is Labour's candidate. I have no doubt that will be the case as far as the uh, election process for, for London's mayor is concerned. <laughs> oh, I've given up trying to work out even who my rivals are going to be. I mean, the point when, uh, when we're having this conversation, I don't even know who the Labour candidate's going to be, and the Tories you know, are on to their second. So I really am not looking greatly at the odds on the other candidates. I'm focusing very much on my own campaign. The Tories, too, recovering from their own political pantomime, are enjoying the spectacle of Labour's internal rivalry. What I absolutely categorically guarantee is that if Ken Livingstone is the Labour candidate, Tony Blair in the privacy of a polling booth will vote for me. Because if I win and I'm a good mayor, he says, well, there you go, I gave you executive mayors. And if I'm lousy, he says, well, there you go, he's a Tory. Whereas he knows that if Ken wins, his problems begin. They don't end, they begin. So I guarantee this, William Hague will vote for me and so will Tony Blair. So that's not a bad start, I've got two already. I really don't believe the, the sort of nonsense you're getting from Steve Norris that Tony Blair is going to vote for him at all. Um, at the end of the day, that would be a devastating humiliation for this government if the system they set up was won by not just our opponents, but um, Steve Norris and all his sort of uh, interesting differences with his own party. You know, I think Tony Blair will want to see a good Labour result in London, and that will be the launch pad for Tony Blair's re-election as Prime Minister the following year. Independent candidate Malcolm McLaren feels strongly that the election of a mayor shouldn't involve party politics. How can we ever test the right of a mayor in this town who is supposed to be there for the general well-being of all Londoners if they are not independent? How can we test whether they're going to be effective at all if forever after they're going into the back room having their hands wrapped for saying something out of turn? Tony Nice, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, dear oh dear, Mr Livingstone, you've said something that is not part of our programme. Smack on the hand. You keep saying that, you'll be out of this party. We dislike you. You're a naughty boy. In our specially commissioned opinion poll, we asked Londoners if they thought the London Mayor should be politically independent. More than half said yes. A third said it didn't matter. 
We also asked if Londoners would vote for a mayor who belonged to a political party they didn't normally support. 62% said yes, 30% said no. Whatever the pollsters and the pundits say, the battle for the London mayor is far from over. The election on the 4th of May is in London's turbulent history uniquely important.